All right, well, welcome to Lunch and Learn. Thank you all for joining us. I'm so happy to see your faces. Um, as you might have noticed, we are recording. So these uh, Lunch and Learns are available on YouTube on our channel. <clears throat> so you can go ahead and rewatch it if you'd like or watch any of the many, many previous editions. One of these days I should figure out exactly how many. I think Raymond tells me this is our third season. That's, I like that he called them seasons, feels extra fancy. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and as he sung said, we were in the news. So um, maybe Raymond can also drop the link to that news story into the chat for all of you. Um, also, if you're on Instagram, you can look at our stories. Actually, I think it's in the feed now. There's some fun little videos of our walk through the space the other day. I wanna start as usual with a land acknowledgement. We recognize that the Clay Studio stands on the indigenous territory known as Lenape Hocking, the traditional homelands of, Len of the Lenape, also called the Leni Lenape or Delaware Indians. These are the people who negotiated in the, 18, in the 1680s with William Penn to facilitate the founding of the colony of Pennsylvania. As part of this land acknowledgement, we reflect on the need to be stewards of the land. We urge you to join the Lenape Nation who still live here to protect and preserve the lands that border the Lenape Sipu, or the Delaware River. Thanks, and now I'd like to welcome Akiko Jackson, Josephine Meta Larson, and Mina King. Um, we are going to introduce you to each of them, and they are each going to then answer our, our normal question and share some of their work with us. So first, Akiko Jackson is from Kahuku, a rural North Shore community on the island of Oahu, Hawaii. She holds an MFA from Virginia Commonwealth University School of the Arts and an MA from California State University, Northridge. Mike Kerb, College of Arts, Media, and Communications. It's quite a name. Jackson has been the recipient of fellowships and residencies throughout the country, which include the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, the Roswell Artist in Residence Program, Pottery Northwest, Vermont Studio Center, and the Watershed Center for Ceramic Arts. Exhibitions include the Fourth World Ceramic Biennial in Incheon, Republic of Korea, the King Luke Museum of Asian Pacific American Experience in Seattle, the American Museum of Ceramic Art in Los Angeles, and the USC Pacific Asia Museum, where she's in an exhibition right now. Right, Akiko? Yeah. Okay, next, Josephine Meta Larson is a Danish American ceramicist born and raised in the US to a mother and father who immigrated from Denmark in the 90s. The last 10 years, split living periodically in the US and Europe have been dedicated to her education and work experience within the field of ceramics. Larson's education in ceramics reflects her bicultural background as she holds a BA in design from the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Art in Denmark and an MFA in ceramics from Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. The specific context of Denmark, however, has been instrumental in the establishment of her artistic identity as it carries a long history of high quality craft and design. At the nucleus of Larson's practice is a strong sense of craftsmanship. And finally, Mina Kim is from South Korea where she received her BFA and MA at Iwa Women's University. She has currently completed her MFA at the University of Arkansas. Mina showed her pieces internationally and nationally including Asia Ceramics Art Show China, the Clay Studio, District Clay Gallery in DC, Frankfurt, Herbstmesse, Germany, and many others in South Korea, including Seoul Art Center, Gimhae Clay Ark Museum, and others, as well as she has completed artist in residence programs at Anderson Ranch Art Center and Gimhae Clay Ark Museum. She is a recipient of numerous grants and fellowships, including NSICA, Multicultural Fellowship, and Arts 360. Mina is also a panelist of National Women's Studies Association and AAPI Heritage Discussion Group of Northwest Arkansas. And she just finished a resident artist program at Mass MoCA. Okay, well, now that we're all thoroughly impressed with these three amazing artists, we're gonna turn to each of them and ask the big question, which is how and why did you make the brave decision to make your life in art? And I'm gonna start with Akiko, because we're going in first name alphabetical order. Hi. Hmm. Oh, 
supposed to prepare for this question. <laughs> it's a hard question. It's better if it's just off the cuff. What was I thinking? No. <laughs> um, well, my decision to go into the arts um, was kind of a roundabout way. I started off, um, I started college in Hawaii at the University of Hawaii as a music and science major. Um, and after just a year, I decided to move and change my focus completely into the visual arts. And that's when I moved to LA, um, living there for about seven years. Um, and it just took off from there. <laughs> I started off um, very interested in sculpture, but um, in my formative years, ceramics always kept coming back. And my very first ceramics class was um, at UH under uh, or with Suzanne Wolf. And she was the first instructor that I saw um, that was able to move in and out of Hawaii in the arts. And so it, it was very inspiring for me to, to see her um, travel to this thing called Ensika, which I didn't know <laughs> anything about back then. And so, um, yeah, it was kind of a roundabout way um, with my studies. And I guess it changes over time on, on staying in the arts and continuing on as a career path. Yeah, well, first of all, um, Suzanne came and visited us once. So I know that she is like a force of nature. Mm -hmm. That must have been great to have her as a teacher. Um, so you kind of skipped over a little bit the part where, you know, even going into music is that's a choice to be, to have a creative life, I guess, which is another way to say it. Do you have something in your childhood that you feel kind of, um, pushed you in that that direction that you knew that something creative was what you needed to do? Um, I don't have artists in the household. Um, growing up, my my parents weren't in the arts, and I didn't have much access to the arts. And I just knew that I needed to express myself some way that was not necessarily verbal. <laughs> um, and so naturally with music that was that was not verbal and then going into the visual arts it, they they both met my my needs um yeah I just uh it was a hard decision because sometimes <laughs> life is very difficult as an artist but I don't want to make the cliche that um artists are struggling artists you know it's just um up and down and I think particularly my interest in the arts is to be an artist in the context of nonprofit art organizations like I'm really interested in working in this context and seeing how different artists live their life and seeing how artists are supported and um, whatever I can offer to that it's it's a big interest of mine yeah being part of a community which I think helps us also radiate that out as a way to not just support our artist community, but also support the community at large, just, you know, by creating positivity and beauty. That's what I think anyway. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and some of what you said, you mentioned also, it's like a constant reassessment, which is important too. It's not, um, you have to, this is from anything that you're passionate about and you love, I think you have to wake up every day and kind of decide that that's what you wanna do. It's like a constant decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Aikiko. Okay, Josephine, do you wanna answer our question next? Yes, thank you so much again for the introduction, Jennifer. Um, yeah, so I think for me, it didn't really feel like an active, decision I guess there's not like I never really knew I wanted to be an artist I didn't even know I was artistic I didn't like I've always had a creative side growing up um but kind of just like Akiko mentioned um, I didn't have anyone in my family that was a visual artist or like artistic in that sense so I didn't really have 
anyone to like look up to for that. So I kind of like found my own way of expressing myself through when I was younger, it was like being really, really into like school projects and being really invested in them. And so I think that notion kind of, when I was in high school, I took just like a ceramics class. Um, I was a junior in high school and took like art one just because I wanted to. And then when I was a senior in high school, I took like a ceramics class. And I think at that point, I, it was like, it kind of like clicked for me, like that I could create these like physical things that felt like a part of me. And it was like, it was a pretty big, it was a pretty big moment. But at that point I wasn't like, it wasn't like, oh, I want to be an artist for the rest of my life. Um, but after I finished high school, I ended up going to Denmark where my whole family's from. And they have like these six month programs for like private art schools. Um, and so I enrolled in a six month ceramics program. And that for me was the big aha moment of like, I think at that point I really realized this is something that I need to keep in my life to keep me happy and to feel like, I always think of myself as kind of like a translator. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think for me, that was the big moment where I was like, this is definitely what I wanna keep doing throughout the rest of my life. Um, and I'm very open. Um, I don't, of course, like the dream would to be a living, working full-time independent artist. Um, but I'm extremely open to seeing like what this journey will will bring me to and all the people that I'll meet and like which kind of like roles that I'll I'll step into along the way. But I think it was probably 20, 2016 when I finished undergrad that I had sort of like made like an internal promise with myself that I was gonna keep ceramics in my everyday life to whatever degree or whatever kind of like capacity um, for the rest of my life. Um, mm. It's something that, yeah, I keep returning to. I'll talk about this in my like presentation of the work as well, but I've had a really, really long break or what has felt like an extremely long break. Um, I haven't had access to a studio for about the last year and four months, um, which has been very interesting because since I fell into ceramics in 2012, it's been constant. I've never had a longer break. I've had short-term breaks where it's been a couple months of just working a job before going to a residency and like that kind of a thing, but I've never had this long of a break. And this break has just like, I've always kind of dreamed or hoped, um, it has really honed in the idea that like, this is the community that I wanna be in. This is the trajectory that I wanna continue on and has just kind of given me so much more like fire and fuel to, yeah, start this life in Philly and to, to continue like my full-time practice. So I'm overjoyed to be here, honestly. It's overwhelming just in the beginning, like trying to settle in, but I'm, I feel really, really grateful that in the midst of COVID and all of these variants and outbreaks that I was able, along with the other new residents to move to a new place and, and to commit ourselves to our practice and our art and our community. Yeah. Wow, really well said. And, um, I feel the same way. I'm so grateful that everyone was, you know, was able to come or is about to be here. And it's such a tumultuous time. It's it's hard. It's yes. extra hard to make these changes, um, especially when the, the building adds yet another variable to that. Um, but a very exciting aspect. <laughs> it's going to be worth it. Um, and I like that both of you talked about communication. Um, Josephine, you just said that you felt yourself a translator and um, Akiko was saying, you know, using art to try to find a way to express your own ideas non-verbally. It's really important and a, a thread that I find so fascinating because I think it, it speaks to that, something that you also both mentioned, which is community. It's like this desire to communicate with people is also related to the desire to be in community with people. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, Mina, would you like to answer our question too? Sure, um, thank you again for introducing us so well. Um, I really appreciate this um, time and meeting, getting to know these people that I haven't met in person through Zoom. So I'm so glad to meet you all. And uh, about my background uh, to decide 
um, myself as an artist. Like, I don't know exactly when I finally became an artist. <laughs> I don't know when that happened, but I started to realize that what I've been doing um, for kind of long time is what artists are usually supposed to do. Um, and I, I was always painting, love making mess when I was a kid and I grew up full of curiosity, like curious about like dark side of adults. Um, there were like bookshelves um, in my dad's reading room and there were so many like fictions and novels um, from um, 1950s and 60s when he was born and it's from their parents as well. And it was a lot of dark stories and I was pretty intrigued by that. Mm. But just um, getting to see some like cartoons that is totally different from kids' cartoons um, very dark and gore. Um, and so it was very interesting. And I was, um, I just seeing, I just liked seeing the very real um, factors in life. I think I was very interested by looking at that. And um, now I doubt about like so-called facts and I find things out every day and make connections and I receive um, sources from daily life, from the outside or from like any daily conversations with other people. And that makes me feel urgent to respond to that mm. um, through like diverse expressions and just always think about how I can make that ideas um, work out and how, how do I want to work on that and I, so I realized that art is the way how I communicate and how I want to be understood than any other possible ways. And I find, and I think this is important for me that I find different kinds of joy from um, every process from the beginning to the end. Um, it's, it's a hassle, but I, I think there are moments of joy, even it's a lot of struggle. So I, I admitted that I'm qualified as an artist finally. Good. Yes, I agree. <laughs> that's great. Um, and so that same connection between um, wanting to communicate ideas. And I love that you are looking through your dad's kind of um, the dark stories. And storytelling is part of that um, uh, desire to communicate, right? Because we're, we, we are telling parts of ourselves when we tell stories, even if they're fiction. So being inspired by storytelling is a wonderful um, entry into that idea of trying to tell somebody else about what you're thinking. It's very interesting too, because your work is not narrative at all, <laughs> or it's not obviously narrative, let's say that. I'm sure that you could tell us the narrative. Um, well, that's great. Thank you again to each of you. That was really illuminating. and. I'm excited now for each of you to talk about your work. So I'm gonna share my screen. So we can um, loop back around and start with Ikiko. Oh, but you're on mute. How's that? There you go. Great. Hi. <laughs> Hello again. So um, when introducing myself, um, I'm often asked, where are you from or where is home for you? And so geographically, here is the island of Oahu highlighted in pink and then magnified so that we can see the town I'm from circled in red. Um, I won't get into all the cultural nuances of what it means to be born and raised in Kahuku, but I'll just mention that coming from this region, I think gave me a sense of identity that connects me um, to concepts associated with collective belongingness. Mm -hmm. And so my body in relation to my surroundings and for example, the black lava rock flanked by a vast ocean. These things gave me a kind of perspective thinking about placement and displacement 
um, what is considered main, such as the mainland, mm -hmm. or what is considered minor, or the problematic notions of who is considered main and who is considered minor. So as a starting point, I created a sea of hair referencing not only my long black hair, but as a marker, um, a marker of something that has physical potential mm. to either connect or separate, um, bringing me to a thought pattern of my physical markings that identify my race or identify me as a person of color or identify me as specifically an Asian woman. I think um, a lot about our hands and how I'm so reliant on them. Um, I've worked hands-on all my life through the process of every pull and braid and tug and tangle. Um, for me, that process is the braid, <laughs> which for me, I, I see it as a cultural marker um, and a cultural marker that we have in so many cultures. And it's also a marker of time. And so when I'm working with clay, I'm often hand building and thinking about these materials that take a very long time to process. You can do the next slide. Um, so what do these various things mean when considering clay as a medium to work with? Um, I love the markings that we have in the materials that we choose. We can do the next slide and each fingerprint representing something different for everyone. For me in these series of urns, um, these urns that I've made, mm -hmm. I'm basically paying tribute to some very dear friends who have recently died in the last several years. And so I, I look at them as a connection to the body as well. So similar to the process of braiding, for me, the process of coiling is also connected to the body. Some of the things um, I wonder about is what do we do with grief and where do we put it? Um, where does it go? Can do the next slide. Is it coming or going, or is it there forever? Um, is it possible for us to mourn together? Or is the process of healing something that is singular? So these are some of the things I think about when I'm in the studio, um, working with clay, working with other materials. Do the next slide. And I often work in multiples. Um, for a while I thought about why am I working in multiples and with many, many reasons with so many um, layers of what symbols mean and what numbers mean. And considering that I seek collective belongingness, I see them as people as well. Um, however, there's this singularity to it that creates a collective whole um, that I'm very, very interested in. And so I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akiko. Um, the, each of your objects is so beautifully rendered. Um, and I've gotten a chance to see some of them in person. If anyone has been into the shop recently, you will have seen um, several of Akiko's vase forms on um, in the shop area. Naima was very 
skillfully installed. So hope you get to see those. And um, I think if you peek over Aikiko's shoulder in this oh. end, you'll see another group of them. And their, um, that sensation of having that group is so powerful. Thank you, Aikiko. Thanks. And obviously if anyone has questions, please pop them into the chat or um, save them for the end and we will come back to you. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen again and we're gonna go to Josephine next. Sometimes the way my screen is makes me have to move things around so I can fix it right. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll kind of give like a broad sort of general statement about my practice and what my focus has been the last few years. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I really do kind of like, or artists in general, I think we do, you know, see ourselves as translators. So my practice has been heavily revolving around actually, you know, a nice contrast to the COVID times that we live in, I get so much inspiration from traveling and being different places and meeting new people and experiencing new cultures and walking through cities and stuff like that. Um, so I feel like that has been uh, a main driving point for a lot of the work that I've undertaken. Um, and so I kind of walk through these scenarios and in my way, translate them into to objects that I present to the world for you to experience in your own way and for you to take kind of your own um, perspective um, from it. So uh, I'll talk a little about a, a bit about um, my more recent work, but there's gonna be two slides here to start with that are older work. So this is a piece that I um, finished in grad school. It was 2018. And this piece is titled um, Object Self-Portrait. And it was a really kind of like cathartic process for me. Um, you can see there's like a smaller object situated in front of a large ceramic slab that has this kind of like reflective mirror uh, surface finish to it. And so for me, this is, yeah, kind of my version of like a self-portrait through clay because you have this object looking at itself in the clay sheet. And I think for me, I see myself like I do, I do become attached to some of the work that I create, um, not all of it, but even if it's not something that I'm like extremely attached to and I want to live with and I have it like in the same space as myself, um, I am inherently a part of every single work that I create. I think as makers, as object makers, especially and as artists, um, we leave traces, you know, physically by by way of our hands and all the pieces that we create, but mentally and emotionally. Um, so this is kind of like a more personal piece. I'm like the, like the, it's, it's still my, like my work is very abstract. So it's, it's not like a, a personal depiction of me, but it's the kind of the way that I see myself through my own work. Um, you can go to the yeah. next slide. Yeah. yeah, and I just wanted to <laughs> somebody's off mute. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's a, and it's a large, that was a, a pretty large panel. And yeah. I guess, uh, Josephine, you're having, every now and then you, um, your voice gets muffled. So I think there might be something that's covering, occasionally covering your microphone. Just Ooh. keep okay. that in mind. Yeah, yeah, just let me know if it gets bad. My computer's just, just like standing on the desk. So let yeah. me know if I need to go back and say something else. Okay, you're good. It was just for a moment. Don't worry. Okay, cool. Yeah, so what Jennifer was saying, I guess some of the photos, it can be difficult to see the, the scale of the work, um, but I have moved into um, larger scaled work over the last couple of years. Um, I've been lucky enough to work in a lot of studios where there have been bigger kilns. Um, I've also been at residencies and in studios where there's a tiny little like size of a microwave kiln. Um, so that's been a really interesting, I think it's a, I think it's a great challenge as a person that's like, my work is very centered around like the physical kind of like bodily experience that you get when you interact or see or kind of walk around the work that I'm making. Um, so it's really good to have, uh, for me, kind of like uh, barriers that I have to go through um, kind of from the, the equipment that I'm around. Um, yeah, for sure. So this piece, um, this was my thesis work. Um, also in 
2018 when I was in grad school. Um, and so I think this piece for me really kind of depicts this notion of perspective that I'm really, really interested in. Um, my bicultural upbringing, of course, and having kind of this like dual identity is something that I'm always thinking about and is something that like surfaces in my work all the time. Um, and I'm never focused on creating something where I want, you know, a sp very specific message to be taken away um, from the piece. Um, I really do like to kind of create these scenarios or situations where they're depending on where you're where you're at and kind of like in uh, where you can what you're looking at based on your perspective. Exactly, based on your own like physical position. Great. Um, so this is the most this is a piece from 2020. Um, just before the pandemic broke out, I was doing a residency in Norway at um, Oslo Academy of the Arts, and they have absolutely incredible facilities. So I was very lucky to have the chance to come and work with um, the students. I was like a mentor for the six months that I was there in the studio, and then I was able to, to use their space. Um, so for me, this work is very near and dear to my heart because it's the last thing that kind of came out before. I had this really, really long break. Um, but again, really, really um, honing in on, on the sheer scale of the work and the craft of the pieces, um, this opportunity that I had to go and work in the studio in, in Norway really was kind of like the biggest challenge of my like artistic practice like so far. Um, they have a massive kiln room where the kilns are like, like six feet by 12 feet. Um, so I really had like an insane playground in front of me. So this is a smaller installation or a smaller groupings of works. I mean, they're still big, but in my eyes, smaller. Um, yeah, I think I, the, the scale is like each of these, the largest object is like three feet, right? I mean, yeah. they're not, yeah, this, they could, they could be tiny things, but they're not, they're big things. Yeah. And they actually, all of these works, I guess you could, uh, I should maybe mention they all started actually as prototypes mm -hmm. um, at a residency that I did um, at Banff um, or in Banff um, at uh, Banff Center. Mm -hmm. So my work also like going the aspect of going from smaller studios to larger studios or just like kiln accessibility is you know something that I'm continuing to work with. So all of these works started as really really small models in 2018 and then like came to fruition in 2020, which was wonderful. Um, so these two pieces, they are just kind of like silhouettes. So there's no top and no bottom. Um, they're about, I want to say 12 feet tall, 11 or 12 feet tall. Um, but yeah, so I was finally able to, to use the kiln to my advantage. And really for me, this, this piece was kind of like, a, I guess kind of, the first time that I was able to, to really scale up and to feel this bodily connection to the work that I'm making, not only in the process of me building them up, but also like when they're finally fired and reoriented. A lot of the work that I create like gets uh, reoriented from when I'm working on it until like it's final, uh, until it's like final position. So for me, this was uh, a beautiful opportunity for me to, to create that bodily experience that, um, that I'm so interested in. And I can see there's a question. Did you be, did you build these pieces in the kiln itself? And I, gladly I didn't have to. Um, the studio has this, and I think at the new studio too, um, or in the new building, we'll have like kiln carts. And that's what I did with these is built them directly on kiln shelves, laid down a bunch of sand, like a big old firing ring, um, lots of sheets in between, and then built the piece up from there. Yeah, this is great. Um, I was able to visit um, that school in Oslo. I was really honored to be invited out there. And I, just seeing that largest kiln was mind boggling. But of course, as a curator, my first question was, um, how are you going to move those things? Yeah, <laughs> Somebody had told a giant like um, swan boat, ceramic swan boat. It was crazy. So where are these? Are they still in Norway? Yeah, so they're actually in a storage unit in Norway. This work is supposed to go to um, not the big tall pieces, but the composition just before. 
um, is supposed to go to Munich this summer, hopefully, oh. if everything works out. But it's a show that's been postponed like three times now. It was supposed to be in 2021, in October of 2021, and now yeah. it'll hopefully be the summer of 2022. Wow. You can see there's another question about the uh, technique. And, so I think we're going to um, come back. We're going to come oh, back to questions at the end, if that's okay. For sure. Yeah, Perfect. totally. Thank you. Thanks so much, Josephine. That was wonderful. Thank you. Excellent. All right, Mina. Um, so this is my piece uh, titled Audience. And um, it was my thesis show last year, um, the last piece that I created in Arkansas. Um, it was installed in, uh, it, it's not gallery, it's a, it's a symmetrical hallway to the performing arts center in the campus. Um, and this room was filled with um, cobalt dyed pinch porcelains. And the, um, the, you can see the next slide, there are, um, six speakers installed um which is feedbacking the sound of the um the previous room where audience um who visit the hall um actually walk on the on the space and it just fit back the sound uh, much louder than what it is um happening in the in this room um i made this piece because i was um I'm still very interested in encountering the act of encountering and act of um, having names and positions like roles and cultural conformity and individuality. Mm -hmm. And I connect with that concept and I sense the power of vulnerability and a hassle of systems from it. And I, I think that's how I um, aware and like connect the world um, from my perspective of you. And I'm a transnational being, I'm from Korea, um, and I naturally translate what I witness and what I trespass me, what trespass me from um, as an ever observer, ever traveler, and ever multilingual. And this happens um, even when I go back to my country, Korea, like I do the similar thing. Um, I spend much time to consider how I want to put my piece in the space because that's how I want to communicate the work. Since um, I see my work viewed, I want my uh, work to become a vulnerable space of intersection. And I want to create multiple connections with unknown others um, through my work. So I allow them to walk and I listen to them. I record the sound of them walking and talking and kind of, welcoming them um, into my space, but just um, in other words, I'm allowing them to invade um, my labors and let them have the accountability to um, have the encounter in their own way. Mm -hmm. And I usually, in my daily practice, so outside of this um, specific process of making certain um, object or certain exhibition, I usually record sounds while I walk or um, while I just um, sitting in my studio, I record sounds and collect images of daily elements or archives from the past events that indicates rhythms of vulnerability, such as news, residues of small and big accidents, um, some like stains that I find uh, from the wall empty frames, debris, sounds of train, dog barking, people yelling, like shouting, um, like ventilation, like honking sound, etc. And I, I like combining materials such as sound photo drawing because it talks to me through different voices and I like the tension and texture of materials um, from different histories and presence. So um, this, the next slide is the proto type that I, I was a Mesmoca residency for a month in November, and I wanted to revisit the memory of my parents and um, how I feel connected to um, their, their memory and their um, 
their memory as an individual. And so I collected some like archives from specific dates and events that was um, pretty dominant in their late 20s and 30s in their memory. And I, I was just exploring what's the, what's the gap, what's the tension between social memory and the private memory. Um, so I, I'm just inspired by surrounding, um, surrounding happenings and just by sensing how it trespassed my body and how it goes away and how it stays with me. So I, that's why I, I try to um, keep my parents' stories um, connected with my work practice while I was in Mesmoca. And ceramic has been a core material that supports the like, desire and urgency of communication and um, its visceral fragility. And also the sound and smell um, has been very important for my practice in the studio as well. I can't, I can't help thinking about the idea that you might be recording sounds and what our old building sounds like and then what our new building is going to sound like and how those that's such a poignant thing that we won't ever get to experience again but mm -hmm. the um there's also joy in having a, a new thing to experience but i'm really moved by your idea about you know capturing these vulnerability moments of vulnerability and how um the sounds of everyday life we can take for granted. I, I see maybe that also as possibly part of your experience with moving around a lot, that wherever you go, there's just a sort of, you have a completely new palette of sound material to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to go to the chat because we did have some questions and then I'm going to ask everyone to kind of comment on what they're excited about for the residency before we close up. So um, Raymond asked, Aikiko, do you sometimes coil your pots upside down? I love specific questions. That's interesting, but um, no, I usually coil them right side up, but it's something uh, maybe I'll try. <laughs> Here we go. Lunch and learn inspiration. And then Josephine, did you build the, oh, you talked about that already with the, um, on the kiln cart. And Diana wants to know if you, do you throw the really tall pieces or coil them? Yeah, everything is hand built. So they're coiled. They're coiled all the way up. All the pieces from that grouping, uh, the smaller composition and the, the larger kind of like conic forms are, are just coiled. Got it. Um, and you mentioned craftsmanship when you were talking about, um, you know, in your first answer to the first question, mm -hmm. and that's so obvious in your work because it is, it's kind I'm of- I'm a bit of a like, technical nerd for sure. Yeah. Like that's, there's, that's definitely an aspect that keeps bringing me back to the clay is like, it's so humbling. Like every time you start a new piece, you just never know for any, any one of us, no matter how much experience you have. Um, so I think that's one of the beautiful things about clay, no matter your experience or your kind of technique. It's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, there's always, there's, there's a little bit of variability, even when you know your material so well. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to just finish by asking each of you, what is it that either made you want to become a resident at the clay studio or what are you most excited about do you want to start Akiko? um well similar to josephine I, I was without a studio for the first time uh in my career uh for m most of covid it was a really hard time um so i was really happy to move to philly and start here at the clay studio um I'm really excited to just work in clay again. I've been doing these residency fellowships that are uh, primarily visual arts of, of all materials. And sometimes there are no ceramics facilities. So I decide to work in a different material, um, but to have access is something that um, once you leave university, once you leave 
uh, some kind of institution, you, you don't have that kind of access anymore. And so um, I'm really grateful that I can work with everyone here at the Clay Studio and I'm so happy to be here, thanks. Yeah, wonderful, we're so happy you're here. Um, I'll just insert what to in kind of in response to that idea of just being mm -hmm. having access. We talk, we think about our mission a lot at the Clay Studio, and we were just having a conversation. A couple of phrases that I wrote down in my notebook were equitable access and being a trusted partner. And these are two of two of the things that we're striving to be for the whole community. Um, but that's something that we've been a little bit more able to do with the residency program this year because we were very lucky to get a big grant from the Wingate Foundation. So um, I'm not sure if everyone on the call knows, but in this new iteration, as we go into the new building, each of the residents is um, or able to offer a stipend and we've been able to remove the um, studio fee. So this, it, it really is a matter of, you know, since I got to the Clay Studio, Jennifer Martin and others, and we all together have been striving to figure out a way to make being a resident artist more equitable and making the economic situation easier was um, the best way to do that. One of the best ways to do that. So we're, we're thankful to the Wingate Foundation. That's what I'm trying to say there. Um, okay, Josephine, would you like to go next? Yeah, I think I already touched on this of like, I'm just excited to be in a community of like-minded people. Um, having been in like normal, regular life as a regular full-time employee at a big company uh, the last year and a half, um, I can't, it's like an understatement to say that I'm like thrilled to be around people that think like me that are interested in a lot of the same things as me um and just being surrounded by like a wealth of knowledge and like being in like a learning situation again I think is one of the things that like it's the reason why I wanted to come to the clay studio for sure and then of course to pursue a full-time practice I've all of the residencies that I've undertaken like the longest one has been about six months so I've always had a very um kind of focused mindset when I've been on a residency and known that there was like an official start date and an official like end date where I just like have to get the things done that I want to get done and so I think I'm really excited to see what it's going to be like to <laughs> I guess it's like a weird way of saying but like live a life and be a full-time artist I know that sounds like kind of strange yeah. <laughs> maybe that's yeah. like what people think that we do anyways but yeah my <laughs> residencies <laughs> my residencies have kind of been like just like very intense months of just like you know 20 hours of work in the studio that kind of a thing so I'm excited to see what that looks like for me and like how to make it's a lot of like logistics but how to like yeah make that work for me over the next hopefully three and a half years but yeah I mean it's not strange a lot of people talk about the place you do a residency specifically for that reason because it is um it's a chance to figure out how you can be an artist and live your life at the same time and integrate those two things and um, it's a supportive environment that's like a kind of halfway there kind of situation which is important yeah great great thank you okay Mina how about you your why you wanted to come or what are you most excited about I was very excited about the new building definitely <laughs> uh, and I mean I always wanted to be in the east coast because like Philadelphia, the place to do is like among in a such a good location um, nearby big cities and big opportunities. And I thought the new building is not just the physical space, but I think it can be uh, such an important like hub area that we can like artists and the institution can win win. Like I love growing together and I think we can support each other in such a good way. So I was very excited about the new building, um, and I didn't know if I can get in get in here, but I made it, um, so I'm really happy. And I was looking for some place that I can actively teaching. Um, I I like meeting people, like I like meeting new people. Um, I like some unexpected <laughs> conversations, and um, that was I I was looking for the balance uh, between my 
work and like living um, system. And mm -hmm. I think this is such a good um, environment to actually start to really practice as a professional artist, like who can really teach mm -hmm. well. So I think it's really um, nutritious to me. <laughs> That's a great way to say that. Yeah, absolutely. And your point about the new building being a hub is really something we've thought a lot about as well. And it kind of occurred to me recently, which might also sound weird. Um, it's not just the clay studio that's gonna be um, and, our, and our artist, our community that will benefit from this new facility. But in fact, I think, I don't wanna overstate, but really the whole field of ceramics in the United States, because there is not another ceramic art facility that's this sophisticated and um, cutting edge. And, you know, when you look at that building, it's like, wow, this, these people must be important <laughs> if they have a building like this. So I, I think it's going to help um, everyone who works in ceramics to really have a, something to be proud of or a higher profile within the general kind of arts community. Not that clay isn't already having an amazing moment more than a moment, but um, yeah, I think it's gonna have repercussions. And Raymond just noted that all three of you are teaching classes at the Clay Studio. So maybe people on the call might be your students or can be your students in the future. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. It's been a lovely hour as usual with our community gathered around us. Um, and the three of you so generously sharing your ideas and, and what inspires you to make your artwork. Um, I hope that once the new building opens, when we start having hybrid versions of these lunch and learns that some of you will come in in person to sit with us and some of you will still tune in online. So we're getting close to that shift. Um, and there's some nice comments more in the chat so everybody should take a look and i hope everyone has a great day thank you thanks everyone thank you thank you